Today at the National Press Club, former Prime Minister Paul Keating. He'll be speaking about the nation's strategic framework. Mr Keating has been critical of the Yorker Security Pact, raising concerns it'll weaken Australian sovereignty. Paul Keating with today's National Press Club address. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the National Press Club and the Westpac Address, coming to you from the lands of the Gadigal people, Sydney, and from the lands of the Ngunnawal and Ngambri people, Canberra. My name is Laura Tingle. I'm the club's president. Yesterday's announcement in San Diego of a nuclear submarine strategy for Australia, as well as for the US and UK, has set our country on a trajectory for at least the next three decades, which has profound strategic defence and economic implications. It ties us inexorably tighter to the United States and the United Kingdom than the words in any treaty could do in terms of our place in the region and the world. It represents another progression in Australia's pushback against the assertiveness that has inevitably come with China's rise as a world power. It also entangles our future plans for developing our manufacturing and broader industry sectors with those of the US and UK. Former Prime Minister Paul Keating has been a vocal critic of the nuclear-powered submarine plan from the start, arguing in an appearance here in 2021 that Australia has lost its way and that the mooted submarines purchase would be like throwing, quote, a handful of toothpicks at a mountain. Today, Mr Keating returns to speak to us in the wake of yesterday's announcement. A short time ago, he released a statement outlining his views, which have been circulated to my colleagues attending today's event at the Press Club in Canberra. He and I will discuss the points he has made before we turn to questions from the floor in Canberra. Mr Keating, welcome. Thank you, Laura. <clears throat> uh, in probably characteristic style, you haven't missed in your, in your statement, uh, and you've called it the worst international decision by an Australian government since... The Labor government. ..by an Australian Labor government uh, since the former Labor leader, Billy Hughes, sought to introduce conscription to augment Australian forces in World War I and that it's a mistake. Yeah. Why is that? It's a mistake. Look, Labor has got all the big ones basically right in the 20th century. It got, it got right knocking Hughes off over conscription. Um, Curtin got it right in knocking Churchill off over the troops from Burma back to, back to uh, uh, Papua New Guinea, you know, back to Kokoda. Um, Arthur Corwell got it right when he opposed the Vietnam War. Simon Crean got it right when he said we shouldn't be sending troops to Iraq and went to the wharf and waved them away while saying they shouldn't be going. Uh, so uh, Labor's had you know, a, a knockout set of rights against the coalition, but this one is where we break the winning streak. And why is that? Where, because underlying all this stuff about the need of nuclear power is the idea that China has either threatened us or has threatened us. It has threatened us or will threaten us. Uh, now, th this is a distortion and it's untrue. The Chinese have never implied that they would threat th threaten us or, e or said it explicitly. But what threaten us means is an invasion of Australia. It doesn't mean firing a few missiles off the coast like the Japanese submarines did in 1943, firing a few things into, uh, in in into uh, the, uh, the eastern suburbs of Sydney. Um, it means an invasion. All great land battles are fought on land. All great battles are fought on land, you know. Uh, they're fought as invasions. Um, uh, uh, Hitler's Barbarossa cost the Russians 26 million people on a fight on land, you know. Uh, before that, there was Bonaparte controlled Europe on land, you know. Um, you can see with the current battle between Ukraine and Russia is on land. So the only way the Chinese could threaten Australia or, atta or attack it is, by, is on land. That is, they bring an armada of troop ships with a massive army to occupy us. This is not possible for the Chinese to do because you would need an armada of troop ships and they'd need to come 13 days of steaming, uh, 8,000 kilometres between Beijing or Shanghai and Brisbane, say, uh, in which case we would just sink them all. See, the moment they leave their port, they are visible straight away on things. See, remember this. The Allies succeeded in Normandy because, because as, 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 a, as a maritime assault, 
because there was an industrial state 21 miles away, Britain. There was no radar and there was cloud cover. So in bad cover, we slipped those wharves onto the beaches of Normandy and got away with it. This is impossible today with satellites. Uh, it's impossible with this sort of no coverage. So what would happen is we wouldn't need submarines to sink an armada, and it would mean an armada of Chinese boats, ships, combat boats, uh, troop ships. Uh, we just do them with planes and, and missiles. You know, the idea that we need American submarines to protect us, you know, three, as if, there's, we, if we buy eight, three are at sea, three are going to protect us from the might of China, really. I mean, the rubbish of it, the rubbish. And so, so, in other words, let me say this. China has not threatened us, and despite five years of this China threat appearing in the Sydney Morning Herald, particularly, you know, written by, you know, provocateurs like Harcher and people, it's all been... Untrue. So it's been if, untrue. So if uh, if there's not if the threat isn't about direct invasion, as you say, there is still an issue about China finding its place in the in the region and being more assertive in the region. Yeah. What's the appropriate strategic response to that? Yeah. Well, I say in the speech, but it's worth saying here. Um, China has committed, in the eyes of the United States, the great sin of internationalism. And what is that sin? To develop an economy as big as the United States. That's the sin. They've got as big as the US. You see, and all those, all those strategic people in the US, they get their little book out and they say, oh, stay as big as us. They're lick, licking through trying to find that, and they can't find it. You, know? uh, you see, uh, they will never, the Americans will never condone or accept a state as large as them. You know, and that's what China presents. China's mere presence. I mean, they would have preferred they remain in poverty, 20% of humanity forever. But the fact that China is now, you know, an industrial economy larger than the United States, larger, according to IMF, 20% larger. They say, hang on, this is not in the playbook. This, this, this is not in the playbook. <laughs> you know, what an affront. You so, know, so th this is what this is about. It's about the maintenance of US strategic. Get this right, Laura. This is about the maintenance of US strategic hegemony in Asia. Now, this is a country which has no, no, no land in the metropolitan zone of Asia. There's no part of it. There's no Alaska. There's no islands. There's no US in Asia. It's 10,000 kilometres across the Pacific to the coast of California. So they are not a metropolitan uh, Asian power, but they claim to be and wish to be the primary strategic power in Asia. You so, know? If so what are the Chinese supposed to say to that? Oh, that's OK. We've been here 4,000 years. We've developed, you know, we've, we've been subjugated by every bugger known to man. We've developed a decent economy, a decent standard of living, you know, a shelter, accommodation, education, you know. Uh, that's our sin, is it? That's our sin. And we've got to be superintended by your Navy, <laughs> you know, by the US Navy. So um, you would always argue that we have to find our security in Asia. Exactly. And yeah. you would also argue that we have to maintain our own uh, sovereignty and our policy. Yeah. If those are the rules, um, but you do have a, 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 a China challenging the orthodoxy, if you like, of the but region. But it's not. But the thing is, it's not challenging. I'm, I'm not. I'm not saying they're, they're talking about threatening, you know, to invade anybody. But you know, they are a rising power, and they are getting more assertive in. in their well, they're power. not stupid. They're what, 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 what is what the would you do if you had an economy do? big, 20 percent bigger than the US? Would yes, you hide we, your light should, under a bushel? What should we do? What, I mean, what, what do you think is the appropriate response? For example, if if the uh, the Chinese want to assert themselves in terms of rights uh, against the Philippines or Vietnam, not we're not talking about an invasion or war, but in terms of asserting their rights, what what is the defence and strategic? Well, do you think the United nation? States in the Western Hemisphere doesn't assert its rights against Cuba? They're another superpower. No, right? no, no, I'm just and that's, saying... That's, that's reasonable enough if you say that's what the US does and you can say, well, that's what China does because it's a superpower. But what does it mean for us? What, what should it, what, we be doing? What it means for us is prosperity. That's what it means for us. Uh, it means that, that, that we, we join with 20% of human, humanity if they, as they've dug themselves from poverty. So you've got to remember this about China. We're speaking of it as though it's almost like the old Soviet Union. It is not the Soviet Union. It's in the IMF. It's in the World Bank. It's in the WTO. 
It's in the WHO. You know, you had Xi Jinping at Davos five years ago pro proselytising in favour of, of uh, globalisation. I mean, this is not a state which wishes to overturn the West, you know. But there's a whole lot of difference in not wishing to overturn the West and copying the nonsense from the Americans that the Chinese should live forever under their strategic command. You follow me? You've also said, though, in this speech that as a result of this announcement in part, that the, uh, that the Chinese, you know, that, you've, that, they've, that we've, we have set the clock ticking almost, that, you know, it has set a new trajectory for relationships in the region. Yeah, look, Chinese, China is a lonely state. That's the truth of it. They would fall over themselves having a proper relationship with us. Fall over themselves. When we supply their iron ore, which keeps their, their really industrial base going, and there's nowhere else but us to get it, you know. We're providing them wheat, we provide them all, all sorts of things, investment, what have you. They, they are 12 flying hours from us. We have a continent of our own, a border with no one, no border disputes with them. Perfect. No, no, we've manufactured a problem. <laughs> you know, don't let the sleeping dogs lie. You know, we've given the old dog a kicking, you know. Um, and, and, and so the, instead of saying, you see, one of the points I've made here and what's one of the principal problems of this deal is that defence has overtaken foreign policy. Overtake. I mean, you don't see Penny Wong out there. You see Miles out there. You know, standing on the submarines is Miles. It's not Penny Wong. So what's happened is, is, is that the, the military have taken over the, the, for, the, for, the foreign policy. And as a consequence, we're not using diplomacy. I mean, let me just make this point. Running around the Pacific Islands with a lay around your neck handing out money which is what Penny does, is not foreign policy. It's a consular task, fundamentally. Foreign policy is what you do with the great powers, what you do with China, what you do with the United States. This government, the Albanese government, does not employ foreign policy, right? But it has improved the relationship with China since it's come to office? Look, it, they've decided not to speak rudely or loudly, but at core, you can see what the outcome is. Here's, here's Anthony Albanese signing up with the Americans, the, Brit the British. I mean, look, the, let's, let's remember about the British. They pulled their grand fleet out of East Asia in 1904. They, they witnessed the capitulation of Singapore in 1942, right? Uh, uh, they then, they then uh, announced their East of Suez policy in 1968. In other words, you're all on your own, you Australians. We're leaving. We'll leave you with Singapore and New Zealand uh, and Malaysia, right, the FPDA, you know. And then in 1973, just to make sure we got the message, they said, well, buggy you, we're going into Europe, so no wheat, no wool, no, uh, uh, you know. Um, and, and so, and then, of course, after the great problem of Brexit, after that fool Johnson destroyed their place in Europe, two world wars, it took two world wars to drag Britain to the centre of Europe to sit beside Germany as a second major power. No, no. You know, the, imp the empirical people, you know, the Tories, that's good enough for us. We're Great Britain. We're the great power. So, OK, they're now, they're now out of... Uh, they're now out of so, so then they're going to put together Global Britain. So they're looking around for, for suckers. Suckers. You know, Global Britain. And they found, ooh, here, here's a bunch of accommodating people in Australia, you know, uh, an accommodating Prime Minister, you know, a Conservative Defence Minister, a risk-averse Foreign Minister. Let's put a proposition to them. So here we are, 230 years, 230 years after, after we left Britain, we are returning to the Cornwall where Morrison did this deal, we're returning to Cornwall and now Rishi Sunak, for God's sake, Rishi Sunak, to, for Australia to find our security in Asia. I mean, how deeply pathetic is that? Well, when we last spoke in 2021, uh, the Morrison government had just announced the AUKUS deal. Uh, you're savagely critical, as we've uh, seen, of um, the Prime Minister and the Foreign Minister and the Defence Minister in this deal. Uh, what does it represent in, in the sense of our strategic and defence position what, what does it that's represent? been announced? Look, I'd say for the cost $360 billion, for $360 billion, we're going to get eight submarines. Right? This must be the worst deal in all history. But let's say $360. If we were, if we were buying uh, 
Collins class replacements, we'd get at least 40 to 50 of those submarines, 40 to 50 for the same price. Now, no Navy has ever done better than having one third of their boats at sea at any one time. So we would have, let's, let's call it 45 to make it simple, you know, or, so, or something like that. Uh, we, we'd have, you know, uh, uh, a, third, a, th a, th a, third of, a third of them, 15, say, at sea. 15 at sea against three nuclear boats. 15 against three. Now, remember, the nuclear boat's only firing a traditional torpedo. It's not firing a nuclear torpedo, just like the other boats. And because it's 8,000 tonnes, that's big, they're discoverable, they'll be discoverable from space. And what's more, they are too big for the shallow waters of the Australian coast. A 4,000 tonne boat, like the Collins, worked perfectly around the Australian coast because it was designed to protect Australia. It wasn't designed to sit off the Chinese coast sinking Chinese submarines, right? So now we've got a big 8,000 tonne clunker. We get three instead of 15. And, and, and you know, the Navy says, I, I saw with Miles, I saw Vice Admiral Collins, the head of the Navy, recently. They came up to see me. And Collins said, you know, well, Mr Keating, he said, you know, we've got to put the snort up every night to get the oxygen. And I said, Admiral, please don't think I'm stupid. You only need to put the snort up if you're going at full power. If you go just cruising, you put the snort up every four days or so. And it may be that it is more risky now than it was 30 years ago. But if you've got 15 of the things at sea, how in the God would knocking one out matter? But if you knock one of the three nuclear subs out, it really matters. So now, they don't snort but they'll be found because of their bulk. Yeah. So in terms of the actual deal, though, um, you've basically said that it's been structured to uh, support US industry um, by yeah. uh, uh, buying into the Virginia-class submarines yeah. in the short term, yeah. and that uh, the deal is driven by the fact that the Americans don't want to disrupt or can't disrupt their manufacturing capacity, and thus there's this proposal for the British to yeah. uh, sort of co-build yeah. the... the uh, yeah. That's right. Well, look, at the, at, 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 uh, at the Kabuki show in San Diego a day or so ago, there's three leaders standing there. Only one is paying, our bloke, Albo. The other two, you know, they've got the band playing, happy days are here again. You know, the American president can hardly keep put three coherent sentences together. You know, he was happy about it all. Rishi couldn't believe, you know, uh, Rishi, Rishi, you know. Uh, and so, guess what? We're going to pass across $380 billion, A dollars, over time to British aircraft BAE systems, a British company, to build these things, and to the, and to the, and to the American submarine things, uh, submarine companies, and we have to build the bases here. So, you know, at the... At San Diego, there was only one payer, the Australian Prime Minister, you know? So how do you think this came about? I mean, you've talked a bit about the fact that, in your, in your statement, about the fact that um, Labor came out and supported the Morrison government's proposition 24 hours after it was made. Hmm. Um, you know, is this because Labor doesn't feel that it can move on national security? Look, what happened? Penny Wong got the job uh, five years uh, six years ago, and she decided that she decided that um, with Bill Shorten at the time uh, that there should be no opening for the Liberal Party to attack Labor on strategic policy. So she folded in with Julie Bishop and then subsequently Maurice Payne. There wasn't a, 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 a there wasn't a bit of difference with them. In other words, they were not going to let she was not going to rustle one leaf or see Labor go into an election campaign with strategic issues being about. So it was a sm the smallest small target policy, right? What happens after five years of this, finally, that Wilful Morrison comes up, run by, run by all the spooks in Canberra, particularly this Andrew Shearer fellow. This is the cook who was still in the Labor nest, you know, He's still running the policy. He's the guy that says, we've got a better idea. Why don't we get rid of those French submarines? You know, why don't we get the US ones? And so, they, with no notice to the Labor Party, 
They call them in at four o'clock one afternoon and see Albanese, Wong and Mal, Miles, and at 10am the following morning, they have taken the policy in its entirety to board. And the Prime Minister's running around recently saying, so I'm very proud to be able to take that policy in 24 hours. Well, how would you take a policy which is going to cost this much money, have these consequences for our relations, A, with China, with the region, B, in terms of our industrial base, how would you do this in 24 hours? You can only do it if you have no perceptive, no perceptive ability to understand the weight of the decisions you're being asked to make. It's, you know, other people call it incompetence. I'll call it maybe try, trying. But, uh, but we're dancing to the tune of, 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 of uh, Andrew Shearer. We're dancing to the tune. It's a Labor government. A Labor government of Aspie, which is this cell, pro-American cell run by a former private secretary or Liberal minister, this Bassey fellow. Right, that, at, because Morrison made clear, the Australian newspaper made clear on the weekend, the foreign minister wasn't consulted. The people consulted were, were uh, the ONA people, that is, and, 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 and um, Aspie. I mean, this is, this is it. And wouldn't you think the first thing a Labor government would do would knock all their heads off? No, no, no. Andrew, Andrew uh, Shearer was in the plane on the way to Tokyo with the Prime Minister. You know, I mean, they, they've been brought in. I mean, the, I mean this, this says something about the left in Australia. You know, I mean, I, I, you know, politically in the Labor Party, I fought the left most of my life, you know, always mostly on behalf of the United States. But the two principal people on the left in Australia are now Anthony Albanese and, 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 and Penny Wong. And what they've done, they, they have, they have uh, uh, essentially accommodated um, the, um, the, the, the strategic wishes of, of the United States, uncritically, uncritically. This is the left. You know, and of course they would say, the old left, oh, that mob in Sussex Street, you can't trust them. But God, you know, if you look at me or Laurie Breton or Leo McClay, all that, we look like Bolsheviks compared to them. Bolsheviks. So where does it leave us in if we are so... Uh, in, the answer is in deep do. Deep do-do. That's where it leaves us. Where does it go? Where does it go? I, I think, uh, uh, I mean, what will happen is we'll get sucked into the American control system. We'll start to... You've got to remember, it was... It was, it was Julia Gillard and Stephen Smith in the, in the Obama visit with the, with the, who first allowed basing in Australia. I would never have allowed American basing in Australia, but they allowed it, you know. Um, so now we're going to have American submarines coming and going. And, of course, they would say, oh, well, of course, these are on rotation. They're not permanent. But if the rotation is permanent, they are permanent. Does it make a material difference, though, that, that, that rotational uh, presence? It just means that we are in the we are in the ambit of the U.S. strategic command system. That essentially we've we've turned the place out. You know, we, in other words, we don't run the place ourselves anymore. It, it, it essentially adds to the sense that we are our own. It, when when we when we get our own Virginia class submarines, yeah. uh, for example, we are basically a, an but, adjunct to the Americans. Yeah, but, is that what you're saying? Yeah, yeah, of course, of course we're of course of course the. the the, the, the reactor is run by the Americans, the control system is run by the Americans, and, of course, Anthony Albanese is running around now. Every second sentence he says, he talks about... Uh, uh, what, what's the word? Um, uh, Sovereignty? Eh? Sovereignty? Sovereignty, yeah. He thinks if he drops a word in into enough sentences in, in an hour, it'll a actually happen. Our sovereignty is just being peeled away by all this, you know. I mean, with, with the Collins-class boats, we had complete sovereignty. And just, I'll tell you something else, which I don't think the media knows, but I know. The French government have offered the Australian government a new deal on the submarines, and that would be the new French nuclear submarine, the newest one in the world, 5% only enriched uranium, not 95% weapons grade. Delivery firm date, 2034, fixed prices. No response have the French had to that. So that we're going to be running around. And, and I mean, the ignominy of having the British around. Here they are. You know, Thatcher wiped out their manufacturing sector. 
<coughs> when she knocked the unions over, <coughs> on the, they're on the bones of their bum searching the world for, you know, um, <coughs> the new Britain, you know. Uh, and and here, we, here we are in Asia going back to Britain, you know, uh, after they've dumped us, uh, completely dumped us all through the 20th century. <laughs> Uh, if just, you were just talking about uh, the low enriched uranium submarines from uh, France. I mean, one of the things that we weren't expecting out of yesterday's announcement, which we did get, was uh, the revelation that uh, we're going to hold on to the uh, uranium uh, and have to find a storage for it after yeah. after the uh, submarines, yeah. hypothetical sub submarines, uh, reach the end of their life. Yeah. What, what's your take on that, in particular, what right. its Im Look, imputation is for uh, non proliferation? Well, I don't think burying spent fuel rods is proliferation, and Australia is big enough for that. It's a, it's, it's a minor issue. Look, the bigger issue is this. I'll read this to you. Every year, the United States Department of Defence has a statutory responsibility to report to the Congress. And in November of 2022, in its report, the Defence Department said this. The People's Republic of China aims to restrict the United States from having a presence in China's periphery. In other words, not having our, our ships run up and down their coast. That's what it really means. Any more, any more than the Americans would consider. Like, just imagine, could you just imagine if the, if the Chinese Blue Water Navy decided to do their sightseeing six miles off the coast of California? Could you imagine the brouhaha that would go on? So here's the Department of Defence, not me, or, or those of us have ever view, the PRC aims to restrict the United States from having a presence in China's periphery. In other words, China wants to have, as a great state, they want their front doorway clean, just as, as if you take the Western Hemisphere, Cuba, Puerto Rico, the Dominican Republic, you know, there's no way the Americans would want anyone else in that area. And this thing goes on to say, the PLA is increasingly able to project its power into the Philippine Sea. Well, you could just about swim across the Philippine Sea. I mean, shocking. Here's the Chinese, but this is the Americans themselves. So here we are, here we are, there's the Australian government where, you know, we're going to stop those Chinese, we're going to poke their eyes out, you know, we're going to get these subs. But the US, the US Defence Department says, oh, by the way, I think the Chinese... I really aren't only interested in their front door, their periphery, you know. You I, mean, I mean, that takes all the speculation out of it, doesn't it? And just make this point about the United States, threats to the United States. China does not threaten the United States. Nobody can threaten the United States. It's got, it's got 10,000 kilometres of sea between the Chinese coast and California. It's got the Atlantic Ocean on the other side. It has a massive country with, uh, in space, in, in land mass and friends in Canada on the north and Mexico on the south and the greatest armaments in all history. So there's no way the Chinese would ever think of attacking the United States and have never thought to attack the United States. So here we're in this position. The Chinese cannot attack the United States and have never thought so and cannot attack Australia and have never thought so. Because if they try to attack us, say, we'd simply sink the armada of the combat ships, come, of, of the troop ships coming. So all of this is all, all, all foreign policy spook-like talk. You know, these, these spook agencies all have a dirty postcard up their sleeve, you know. When I was Prime Minister, uh, people would say, oh, you're not at all interested in the cables, you know, the, 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 the product of, of the security agencies, you know. And they'd have some, oh, PM, we've been listening to someone's phone and they've just said this, you know. I said, listen, if I want to find out about Malaysia and Singapore, I'll read the Straits Times. I'll get more out of that than your nonsense, you know. Um, the, the language yesterday was all about this being a deterrence um, at some level. That it's sending a signal to China that, you know, we're, we're not... In other words, we're not going to... You may attack us when we know they're not going to attack us and have never threatened to attack us and don't wish to attack us. That's the point, you see. Don't underestimate the effect that the Sydney Morning Herald and the Age for five years, you know, that, that you know, I've been attacked by, uh, by Harcher, that psychopath who runs this attack on me about me being a representative or putting the views of the People's Republic of China, you know. But he's had free movement 
for five years to run this scare campaign in Australia. Uh, this was supported by the management of Nine Group. Uh, this fellow, James Chessel, I understand, sits at the top. So Chessel is part of the responsibility here, you know. And so this, this maniac has put this stuff, and he, he's on the ABC, he's on the drum every other night, you know. He's got the great stentorian voice, but no stentorian mind to match it. The suggestion always is that your commercial interests drive what well, I have you say none. about China. I have, let me make this. Let me, do, let me do with this. They talk about me on China Development Bank. I, I was on China Development I, I, By the way, I left five years ago, right? I was on the China Development Bank board for 13 years and 10 years as chairman, right? With Henry Kissinger, with Paul Volcker, with the manager, former manager director of the IMF, Jacques de la Rosier. And you know what our fee was? $5,000 a year. $5,000, what they didn't even call it a fee, they called it an honorarium. I have no commercial interest in China whatsoever, none, none. So I had, and you know what I used to do before I'd go to a China Development Bank meeting? I'd visit Glenn Stevens and I'd say to the governor, the governor of our central bank, Glenn, what would you like me to inject into the conversation up there this, this week? Every year I would see him and when I got the Chinese papers back, I would give them to the Reserve Bank. In other words, I sat as an Australian representative, essentially with Kissinger as my deputy for these years, sitting there, picking up intelligence out of the PRC, hoping I was doing a great thing for Australia and taking it back to the central bank here. That's what I was doing. But I've had to put up with this stuff out of uh, Sky News, you know, that, that Dill Bolt and others, and, and, and of course, uh, you know, I'll acid drop himself, uh, um, uh, uh, Archer saying, oh yes, but look, Keating's views are compromised, as if an Australian Prime Minister would compromise his commitment to the country because he sat on some international board and getting paid $5,000 a year and having no other interests there. Having said all of that, and not, reflect, not in any way suggesting it's about commercial interests, but have you been surprised by the way the Chinese have developed their military in the last five years. Uh, you know, it, it, it's, yeah. it's been an exponential growth in their spend. Yeah, but their, but their percent of their spending, uh, defence spending to GDP is only a third of that, or 40% of that of the United States. As long as you understand that, right? They are bigger, so 40% of bigger is more, but it's nothing like the United States. The United States spends more than the next 10 countries behind it. But why are they doing it? Why are they? Well... They're doing it because, A, they have a huge economy which is internationally dependent uh, and because, uh, more latterly, they have this sort of pressure from the US. And so, like every state of its... Remember, the IMF says, on a purchasing power parity basis, China is 20% larger than the US. So what do they want them to do? Have, have little toy destroyers in the bath. You know, they could, like a little boy in the bath, they could muck around little boats in the bath. Would that suit the Americans, you know? But you, you have said, nonetheless, that China doesn't have any territorial ambitions. It doesn't, no. So why do you need such a big land army, such a big navy? Well, uh, that, it's, uh, the land army of, of China is really part of the police force of the place, really. I don't, it's like a paramilitary type, the same as Indonesia, you know. Um, look... The Chinese are locked into a bowl. They've got Siberia to the north, they've got the Himalayas to the west, they have Indochina to the south. They don't go anywhere. They're not attacking anyone. All they've done is they've militarised those shoals in their South China Sea, but that's all about, as the American Defence Department says, restricting the United States from having a presence in China's periphery. In other words, until this happened, the US 7th Fleet used to patrol up along the territorial sea of China, six miles off the coast. You know, the Chinese said, bugger this, we're not having this anymore. You know, we don't want to be rude, but we don't have to put up with this anymore. You know. Um. Um, if I could just ask one question before we turn to our, uh, my colleagues in Canberra, um, which isn't directly related to, um, to AUKUS, but yeah. uh, it does go back to some comments you made in 2021 and is relevant to the Ukraine uh, situation. What, what's your view of... China's uh, ambitions to the West in the Starns, given you know the incredibly well, you know, I, rich payload. Of, yeah. uh, well, I told you this on our last program, last time we met here. China's interests are not in the East. See, 
Australia and the US think, oh, the Chinese, you know, they're going to you know, muck around with the Philippines. They're all, all their interests are in the East. No, no. What they, what's their interest in the East is the front, to keep the front door mat clean, not have the US 7th Fleet up there. Their real interests are in the West. The West of China and in the stand countries, Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan, these countries, which I believe they'll have major influence in all the way up to Istanbul. You know, you can say, so China, see, this is, this is the point. Uh, developed countries like Australia are about 90% urbanised. China, uh, that's Germany, France, US. China is 55. It's got another 35 to go. And it's got the stand countries. So China's growth is just going to keep on coming, you know. Um, and as you know, they've got an agreement to take railways and roads up to up to Gdansk in Poland. So here's the Americans. Uh, I mean, they've always been protected by the two oceans. But now for the Americans, the Pacific and the Atlantic are a corset. They're a corset on them. They've got nowhere to go. They're protected, but they've got nowhere to go. Well, the Chinese have got lots of places to go. <laughs> Well, we'll switch to uh, uh, the press club in Canberra and my colleagues I there. Put something in my ear. Yes, we've got some questions. Um, and uh, while we're just sorting out Mr. Keating's earpiece, the first question today will be from Phil Curry from the Financial Review. Uh, thanks, Laura. I hope you can hear me, Mr. Keating. Um, look, R Richard Miles, perhaps in anticipation of your comments today. Uh, in defending the, yesterday's announcement said, we have witnessed in our region the single biggest conventional military build-up anywhere in the world since the end of the Second World War. He says to not respond to that is to be condemned by history. Could I just ask you to clarify, do you think we should not respond to it at all or we're responding in the wrong way? We're responding in the wrong way. The Collins-class boat, which, 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 which uh, I built with Kim Beasley was a boat designed in the defence of Australia. It was designed to protect, to present the continental shore, the continental lands of Australia, and to repel any invasion of us. What these what these boats are, and this is what I don't think uh, uh, the defence minister is telling you, is that these boats are designed to sit off the continent the continental shelf of China and sink American nuclear nuclear-capable, weapons-capable submarines. Now, just, I'll just make this point to you. China's peripheral waters... Let's make this point that people may not know. About 100 miles off the Chinese coast, there's a plateau. It's a very shallow plateau. A very shallow plateau. Any, any American nuclear... nuclear-armed subs got to get across that plateau before they get to the deep water. So the Americans said, ah... We can have, like, ducks in a shooting gallery. We will shoot them out before they can get to the deep water. But in, in the Chinese shallow water, the Chinese have it absolutely loaded with sensors and with equipment to detect large submarines. An 8,000-tonne submarine is going to be visible in a second with the Chinese coming across it. So our submarines are going to be susceptible. Our, our submarines are going to be um, uh, in the peripheral waters of China, where the platforms and sensors are most concentrated, right? So while the Americans think they can shoot Chinese submarines like duck in, ducks in a barrel, the Chinese can also shoot our submarines because we're in the shallow water and we are detectable, right? So this is, a, this is a strange way to be defending Australia, to have your submarines sunk on the Chinese continental shelf, uh, chasing Chinese submarines, where in fact, with the, with the uh, Collins model, you had and if the numbers are right, 45 or 50 conventional submarines around the coast of Australia saying, put a step over our finger, we'll punch your lights out. That's the better defence policy for Australia than joining with the Americans up there in the shallow waters of the Chinese coast trying to knock out... See, look, you know this, Phil, you may know this. The Chinese in their... In their the air sea battle plan they had eight or ten years ago, is whether they could knock out all the Chinese nuclear weapons in one strike. And people doubt that this can happen. You know, you can find the sites and knock them out. All states. So what, what's, what big states do is they have submarines in deep water that carry the same nuclear weapons that are not subject to a strike. It's called a second strike capability. 
What, what the Americans are trying to do is deny the Chinese a second strike, strike capability. And we'd be the mugs up there helping them. You know, we'd be up there saying, oh, no, we'll put our boats into jeopardy uh, in the shallow waters of China. Instead of what, what is our aim in life? It is to protect the continent of Australia. Border with no one, shallow waters. We don't need 8,000 tonne submarines. Collins was four. We could have 50 Collins-class boats and 15 at sea and we'd have a much stronger defence than this rubbish that the government's doing. So um, you might like to adjust your earpiece again, Mr Keating, while we uh, get ready for the next question, which is from Karen Barlow from the Canberra Times. Uh, thank you, Mr Keating. I want to draw you towards Indonesia, a place I lived for two years. Uh, you visited many times as Prime Minister. In 1995, you uh, signed the landmark security deal with Indonesia. And a year later, in Singapore, you talked of the great uncertainty with China. On Indonesia, could you talk to the impact the AUKUS agreement will have on the Australia-Indonesia relationship? Well, look, I've said before many times, Australia's strategic bread is buttered in the Indonesian archipelago. A major attack on them, and the only people who could attack them majorly would be the Chinese, would affect us, whether we liked it or not. And a major attack on us would affect them. So this is why I put the agreement together with Suharto, an attack on any one of us was an attack on all of us. So what, what wise governments do is they put safety things in place. You know, you don't sit there waiting for someone to hit you over the head to think, hang on, I better, I better put a few defences up here. So... The, the, Indonesia is central to our, our security, uh, our, our long-term security, um, and uh, not that I expect, let me repeat, I don't expect any Chinese military assaults upon the Indonesian archipelago or us, but, but nevertheless a prudent country running a defence policy, which is what I've done uh, in the years I was in office, would be to, to see, uh, 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 to have that, uh, to have that, archipelago at least, you know, capable of, of not intrusion by, let's call it, a negative power. Now, but you see, what the difference is, what, what, um, what, what, what Anthony Albanese has done this week, he screwed into place the last shackle in the long chain which the Americans have laid out to contain China. We are now part of a, of, of a containment policy against China. You know, we've got Japan, the US, ourselves uh, and India, right? And buying these subs uh, was like Anthony Albanese screwing up the shackle to make sure all the chains are connected. That, that's what we're doing. Instead of doing a more sensible thing, say, look, our bread is buttered in Southeast Asia, it's Southeast Asia that matters. It's Indonesia which matters. Let's get along. I mean, the Chinese don't want to attack anybody. They don't want to attack us and they don't want to attack the Americans and they don't want to attack the Indonesians. So what is all this? It's only about one matter only, the maintenance of US strategic hegemony in East Asia. This is what this is all about. You know, and I go back to the point I made to Laura. If the US has no continental land in East Asia, how does it protect, how does it suspect or argue that that it can remain the strategic superpower. Because if it all turns badly, it'll be just like Afghanistan and Iraq. The Americans will pull out and leave the mess behind. They would just go back to San Diego, 10,000 kilometres, and leave us with the consequences. You know, that, that would be the outcome. Andrew Proben from the ABC has a question. Uh, Mr Keating, you said before that, um, that China has not threatened Australia. But how do you reconcile that with the fact that um, they have uh, issued sanctions on coal, timber, wine, lobster, barley, Australian products, um, that there has been a uh, debt diplomacy employed among our Pacific neighbours, an encroachment of the South China Sea, an effective annexation of some islands, uh, a huge military ramp up that uh, that Laura's asked you about. How is this not, as one Bi a Biden official said this week, undeclared economic and commercial boycott of Australia? Threat to Australia is a military threat, mate. A military threat. 
it's a it's a threat for for the uh, for for uh, the, the the army of the People's Republic of China to come and occupy Australia. That's what a threat is. Like for instance, a similar threat would be if someone went to occupy Tasmania on us, right? Uh, that that's what that's what a threat is. Commercial commercial reactions commercial attack. reactions on things like the things you mentioned they're, they're not strategic they're not in a threat you know I mean look look at what we're doing to them and the WTO and all the steel dumping and all the rest of our stuff you know I mean you know the the, the in the friction of international politics these things turn up but they're not threats you can't impute threat meaning meaning invasion with putting a, a tariff on wine. Or maybe you're silly enough to think that. You know, do you think you cyber are silly attack, enough Mr. to think that? Mr Keating, right? cyber attack. Well, what, do you think the Americans and the Russians are not into cyber attacks? Who, who in the world is not into cyber attacks? Or do you think we are not? You know, just, rem just remember this. Uh, the best friend we had in Asia was a, f was a f former president of Indonesia, Bartu, Yoda Hono, you know? He was the best guy we had barracking for us, you know. Those dopes in ASIS tapped his telephone and that of his wife. Tapped his phone. I mean, this is what states get up to if you let these security agencies, Ning Nongs, take control, you know. But you can't impute, as your, as your question imputes, that a, that, that a tax or a tariff on wine or barley is equivalent to, to, to an invasion of the country. China does not threaten Australia, has not threatened Australia, does not intend to threaten Australia. You can have all these commercial rows you like. We can have diplomatic sort of dust. Remember, this all happened after, after um, Maurice Payne, you know, the great non-minister of our time, went on the Insiders program and said we're going to have weapon inspection, weapons type inspections of, of Wuhan to find out what was the cause of the virus. It was out of that came all of this, you know. So you can't put a question without contexting it. Like, you, know, you know, I mean, contextualisation may not be your long suit, but that's what you should be doing. <laughs> Olivia, Kays Olivia Kaisley from Sky News. <laughs> Olivia Kaisley from Sky News. Uh, you've described Foreign Minister Penny Wong and Defence Minister Richard Miles as seriously unwise in this nine-page document. Unlike present players, you haven't received a military briefing on this issue since the mid-90s. Could you be out of touch on this issue? And given you didn't foresee uh, the military build-up uh, from China as well as intimidation of neighbouring countries uh, when you were in office, what makes you so sure China isn't a military threat to Australia? Because I've got a brain principally, and I can think, and I can read, you know, and I read every day, you know. I mean, why would China want a threat? What would be the point? They get the iron ore, the coal, the wheat. What, what would be the point of China wanting to occupy Sydney and Melbourne militarily? And could they ever do it? I mean, could they ever bring the numbers here? It would, it would be an armada of troop ships to do it, you know. So you don't need a briefing from... from, from from the dopey security agency we have in Canberra to tell you that, you know. I mean, I know you're trying to ask a question, but the question is so dumb it's hardly worth an answer. Well, so do you just but, let them carry on with their business, whether that be in the Spratly Islands or wherever you just say, oh, the well, they, they don't plan to attack the, Australia, the so it's all OK? Yeah, you, know, you, know you know how big the... the, the, the um, what's the other islands we're always talking about? Just, just, look, just pick it up. Just go on to Google Maps and have a look at it. It's about as big as Centennial Park, about as large as Centennial Park in Sydney. That's what we're talking about here. You know, I mean, you know, Sky News. You got to, you know, you got, you got to dust up your reputation beyond Sky News. You know, and you're probably doing your best to do that. Then, Thank you. <clears throat> then, then Westcott from Bloomberg. Uh, thank you very much for your talk, uh, Mr Keating. Uh, ben Westcott from Bloomberg. Um, I just wanted to ask, uh, you've talked a lot about uh, orthodox threats, uh, that being an invasion uh, of Australia, but you know, as my colleagues have set up here, there are many other different types of threats, and particularly for Australia, uh, we're a trading nation, all of our um, wealth comes in large part from overseas trade, and that's you know, similarly to the US interest in Asia. A lot of their trade comes from Asia as well. Shouldn't Australia you know, work with 
partner like the US to protect trade, which is its main economic interest in the region? This is the United States that would never, ever agree at congressional level to ratify uh, the international uh, the inter international program on the law of the sea. You realise that, don't you? The US refuse to ratify the law of the sea program, right? So that puts a pretty big hole through that question, doesn't it? Second, secondly, second, secondly, uh, why would the, Ch the Chinese can't find an alternative supply to Australian iron ore? They've got 30% of their country still to build. We have the, the highest grade, 63% FE iron ore, 10 steaming days from their coast. What, do you think they don't want that? You think we need, we, we need the American military at the Pentagon to make sure our, our iron ore boats go to China? The China, Chinese, it's a wonder they don't have a welcome for us out every day one of these damn things turns up because all that tonnage on their wharves build these Chinese cities. Chinese, the story of modern China is a story of urbanisation. That's what it is. Urban areas are built with steel. Steel can only be done in China out of Australia. So why would the Chinese want to interrupt their capacity to deal with us? You know, why would we see, see some donkey in Washington to help us? Yeah. Jess Malcolm from The Australian. Thanks, Mr Keating. I'd like to ask you about the government's proposed changes to super tax concessions and whether you have a position on that. I'm not doing, this is all about AUKUS. I'm not doing super today. I mean, I've done super since, since I was a kid. <laughs> um, Matthew Knott from the Sydney Morning Herald and The Age. I do have a backup question. I, I do have a question on China. Um, China's submarine fleet is forecast to grow by six nuclear-powered submarines by 2030, and they're building 20 service warships a year, which is even more than the entire Australian fleet. In your opinion, who is being more provocative, Australia or China? Uh, not, what the Chinese do in the building of fleet is not provocation. Why do you use the word provocation? That's the wrong word to be using. You know, they're, they're a major state. They have an economy bigger than the United States. They spend about 40% of their national budget on defence. The American spends more than the next nine states in the world on defence. So why is it a provocation? Why would you think it's a provocation for a great state like China to build a navy? Why would you think that? I mean, I just don't accept it. You know, the, the question's invalid. Yes, that's the truth of it, you know? Thank you. <coughs> Matthew Knott from the Sydney Morning Herald and The Age has a question. Uh, hi, Mr Keating. I'll ask two parts if I could. Uh, you've been extremely critical today uh, of the Albanese government, uh, including ministers uh, Richard Miles and Penny Wong. Are you concerned that your comments today could represent a fundamental rupture with the party? You've already said that the Prime Minister hasn't uh, responded to your request to brief him on this. And secondly, you have a, a tremendous uh, skill uh, for invective and criticism. Could I ask you now to turn some of that to the Chinese Communist Party and its treatment of uh, Uyghurs, for example, its treatment of pro-democracy activists in Hong Kong? Will you be similarly critical of them as you are of people in your own party and journalists? After what you co-wrote with Harcher last week in that shocking presentation in the Herald, on Monday, Tuesday, and when you should hang your head in shame. I'm, I'm surprised you even have the gall to stand up in public and ask such a question, frankly. You know, you ought to do the right thing and drum yourself out of Australian journalism, you know. I mean, the, that's the, the most egregious, the worst, the most biased presentation. You pick up four specialists. You could have picked up John McCarthy, a long-term specialist, uh, Alan Gingell. You pick up four China hawks, the, the biggest of them all, Jen, Jen, Jennings, uh, you know, Davina Lee, these are all China hawks. You represent them to the your community as having an independent view where well, you know full well that you've, sacked, you've, 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 you've selected them to the, do this thing. And here you are asking me about Uyghurs and you're asking me about... Uh, if I said to you, and I did say when I saw it last time, here's the Prime Minister over, there's all, everyone over to India, not one question from any one of you about, about Modi shutting in the Muslims in Kashmir, in the pro-Hindu policies. Nothing. But there is still a question, Mr Keating, about the Chinese treatment of the Uyghurs. Yeah, well, look, look, the treatment of the Uyghurs... I'm not to defend China about the Uyghurs. I mean, 
there's disputes about what the nature of the, of, of, the, of the Chinese affront to the Uyghurs are. There's a dispute about that. But one thing we can't be sure of, what if the Chinese said, but look, what about deaths in custody of Aboriginal people in your, in your prison system? You know, wouldn't that be a valid point for them? Wouldn't it be a valid point? In other words, great power diplomacy is, cannot be about reaching down into the low social entrails of these states any more than they can with us. You know, but the Sydney Morning Herald, uh, frankly, has, has lost. It's, 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 it's a newspaper without integrity, and and uh, and and the age follows it in, poor little like a little pup running behind. Uh, you know, I mean, if I were you, mate, I'd hide my face and never appear again. On on the subs for the record, Mr. Kidding, we're, we're very proud of our journalism, and you know, we think that's made an important contribution yeah. well, to the fair. national debate. But can I just clarify? Do you think that it really is in dispute about what China has uh, been doing in Xinjiang? It's been uh, very well chronicled by the United Nations, right, which issued a detailed report right, last well, let year. Me, let, well, let, let me ask you: Do you, what do you believe Modi and his Hindu party is doing to, to the Muslims in Kashmir? Why you've got a view on that? A question about China back to one because about India. you're the, because you're not honest enough to recognise that the guy you support, Modi, has the same sort of problems as as the Chinese have. You know, we've uh, reported uh, on problems uh, in, yeah, in yeah, India yeah, as well, but yeah. we're talking no, about China. No, right no, now. no, you don't. You're all a soft touch on India. That's the truth of it. Um, yeah. uh, just while we're waiting for Maeve Bannister, may I appear to ask you a question? Could I just follow up on Matthew's question about whether you're concerned about a break with the party? The, pa these, the, party, the, the, the party, the party. When I saw Anthony Albanese, at, 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 he asked me at the Kirribilli about a couple of months ago before he saw Xi Jinping. I was the last person to talk to him before he saw Xi Jinping at the G20. And I said, these issues are so big, Anthony. It's a case for me of country before party. You know, I'm not going to have Australia's long-term strategic interests compromised by rubbish in the Labor Party, you know, and an understanding, you know, of, of, the, of the issues. In other words, um, you know, I would have expected him from the left and, 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 and Penny Wong from the left to have stood up with a position... Look, look at, look at Labor's great history in China. Gough recognising China in 1972. Uh, Hawke was Hu Yabung, you know, uh, the Chinese Party secretary, and, and, and Xiao Ziyang, the Premier, you know. Uh, the APEC leaders, the APEC meeting. I did the APEC leaders meeting. I talked, I talked the Chinese into sitting down with Hong Kong and Taiwan. Could you imagine any of these people getting the Chinese to sit down in APEC with uh, with, with these people? Um, uh, and then 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 there's uh, 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 I then did the deal with Indonesia. Kevin did. Kevin Rudd did the East Asia summit. You know, we've got this huge, proud history. But Wong drops the whole thing. So she drops the whole thing five years ago not to be running a small target policy. There's no way I'm going to let, let the Liberals wedge me on, on, on national security because I'm on the same... Look, I'll little, tell you a little story. Harcher wrote a book and asked on the back for comments... And Penny Wong was going to attend the book launch with uh, Maurice Payne and was going to add the comments to the back cup jacket of the book. So I discussed with this with... And remember, she's the shadow foreign minister and Harcher is the enfant terrible of this debate. Right? She's turning up with that. So I discussed with uh, Gareth Evans and Bob Carr about this and I said... You've got to tell her if she goes to the launch and she puts something in the back of the book, I'm into her. And I think Carr is too. And so she didn't. But you see, that's how, that's, this, this is a small target thing. This is where we've got, you know, we've got to, in, in her administration of the policy. You know, it's, it's terrible. Maeve Bannister has a question. Thanks, Mr Keating. Maeve Bannister from the Australian Associated Press. Um, China has criticised the AUKUS Security Pact as Australia disregarding concerns of the international community and being in breach of the Non-Proliferation Treaty. But the Chinese military itself has uh, nuclear-powered technology capabilities. So is China being hypocritical, do you think, and why shouldn't Australia have that same capability? Well, 
we'd have the same capability if we needed it. <laughs> I, think, I think that's the answer. We wouldn't worry about the, what the Chinese said. I mean, bugger the Chinese, you know. We'd have the same capability if we needed it. My point is we don't need it. We'd be far better off with 45 Collins-class new age submarines in the defence of Australia. So say, put your toe over our beach and we knock your head off. That's the policy. In other words, we've gone from a defend Australia policy now to a forward defence policy, the old forward defence policy. We're going to sit with a bunch of American submarines off the Chinese continental shelf and try a duck shoot of Chinese nuclear armed submarines. I mean, this is not the defence of Australia, you know. So if we needed nuclear armed submarines, nuclear power, we wouldn't take any notice of what the Chinese said. But the fact is, we just don't need them. The next question is from Paul Karp. Thanks very much, Mr Keating. Uh, despite the Albanese government's uh, support for AUKUS, it does appear to have made progress normalising the relationship with China. Could I please ask, is that worth anything? And uh, does that show that a productive economic and political relationship is possible despite AUKUS? Well, mate, you'd have to be naive to be thinking that, wouldn't you? I mean, you have to, you know... You know look, what I, what I said in the speech, I'll try and find it. Um, uh, I said... Um, uh, I'll just find the words. Uh, no mealy mouth talk of stabilisation. Get the emphasis, mealy mouthed. Talk of stabilisation in our China relationship or resort to softer or polite language will disguise from the Chinese the extent and intent of our commitment to the United States' strategic hegemony in East Asia with all its deadly portents. Really, I mean, so in other words, they're not going to be a rude. As, as Scott Morrison. They're not going to be as rude as, uh, as um, Maurice Payne. They'll talk softly, but by the way, we'll put the last shackle in the, con in the chain to contain you. You know, the China say, oh, thank well, look, thanks for that. I'm glad you're speaking to us more nicely. <laughs> we've, we've only got a couple of minutes left, Mr Keating. Um, the next question is from Dan jarvis Barty. Thank you for address, Mr Keating. Dan jervis Barty from The West Australian. Can I ask how widely held do you think your view is about AUKUS within the Labor Party, both at a grassroots level and among parliamentarians? And if it is widely held, why are you the only one that's speaking up? Well, generally because I have been championing these issues for, you know, last 30 years, that's a reasonable reason. I'd say the majority of Labor people would share my view about this. I'd say in those branches of ours, when they work out that that we have returned to Britain 230 years after we left, after the British dumped us all through these years, that we're going to bail the British BAE systems and British aerospace companies and submarine companies out and build their marine for them. I, th I think the average... When the average branch Labor Party member gets onto this, you know, uh, I mean, it was like... Uh, you know, I, I think there'll be a big reaction to what, what the government's doing. I mean, there's no mandate inside the Labor Party, no mandate, for what Prime Minister Albanese, the Foreign Minister Penny Wong and Richard Miles are doing. No mandate. The next question is from Julie Hare. Uh, Mr Keating, Julie Hare from the Australian Financial Review. Um, I'm just a little bit confused and I'd like you to clarify if possible. You say that China is not a threat to Australia, but you agree we need to respond to their military build-up using Collins-class submarines. How do you explain that contradiction? Not their military, anyone's military build-up. In other words, you have... What a defence policy is about is prudence. You prudentially cover your bases. The point of the Collins was to, was to cover us against any comers, not the Chinese, See, remember this, when I did the Collins with Kim Beasley in the late 80s, China's defence was nowhere. Chinese military was nowhere. I mean, I don't mean anywhere, I mean nowhere. But we built the Collins-class submarines prudently so that we could pretend the country, and that's still the same today. And the thing is, what would you rather? Eight Collins-class boats or nine, or sorry, four, 15 at sea permanently, or three nuclear boats? You've got to remember, they're only firing traditional torpedoes, You're not firing nuclear torpedoes. So there we are, the massive marine maritime reaches of Australia. We've got the three boats out there, and I hope you Chinese are quaking in your boots. I mean, I'm sure they'll be quaking in their boots. 
Mr Keating, we're out of time. Um, I have received a message saying that uh, Penny Wong actually launched Peter Harcher's book, contrary to what you said. Oh, no, no, she launched it, but she didn't put, the, 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 I think, the sticker on the back, you know. And I had many people saying to me, please don't hop into her. Please don't hop into her. And it was with all the restraint I could muster that I didn't. Well, you seem to have hopped into her a fair bit today. Um, yeah. So um, thank you for your observations and uh, thank you for joining us at the Press Club today. OK, thank you so much.